Today's class is called our migrant crisis. And I'm calling it our migrant crisis because uh, President Biden is, uh, while he was, he and the Democrats were quite willing to look at this migration issue, especially with children on the border um, and, uh, and immigrants try coming to the United States and trying to get into the United States, both legally and Ill illegally or without documents. Um, they were willing to refer to it as a crisis when uh, uh, Donald Trump was in power, but suddenly now uh, Biden's referring to it as an as an issue, right? <laughs> or uh, I forget how he said it the other day, but it's kind of like a, it's like an issue. No, it's actually a crisis if you want to call it a crisis. For for some people, it's very much a crisis, and I, and I want to look at it, and I want to I want to look at it in, in some different ways, um, and and before we start. I want to I want to say the following. Um, back in the day, I used to to study immigration. In fact, when I was uh, doing my master's work, when I was looking at, as I mentioned last class, I started really to getting into Latin American issues of Latin America. There were two different ways that I was going to go. One was to to be a an immigration scholar and with specific focus on undocumented immigration. And I'm going to use the word undocumented because that's just what we use around the world. Um, but uh, I was either going to be an immigration scholar or I was going to be a scholar of religion and the church in Latin America and development. And I ended up becoming neither. But I did spend uh, two and a half, almost actually three years, pretty extensively studying undocumented immigration. And so I, I delivered papers at, at a number of conferences and wrote uh, a number of papers and so on. So I... Uh, uh, so it, it's something that I've been studying now. So that makes it, you know, gosh, almost about, about 38 years or so. Um, but I w what I want you to know is it's a really complex issue. OK, I understand it's a complex issue. So I'm not going we're not going to take political sides here. You know, this idea that we should open the borders to anybody who wants to come in or we should close them down to everybody who doesn't have papers and so on. N neither. It, this is just an incredibly complex um, issue under under in conversation. And I'm not I'm, I'm going to treat it that way. And what I want what what, you, what I want you to know is that um, the people who well, hang on. Let me. That's all. Just understand, okay? I'm. I'm not going to take. I'm going to take multiple sides of this, and there are multiple sides. There's not just two sides. So let's bring our first uh, volunteer in, which is who is Sean. Uh, if you can, um, ha, ha, t yeah, his camera's on. We'll give it a second for everybody to, to, to get you onto the stream. Yeah, and I'll take this opportunity to fix my microphone. Sean, how you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? So you're a, you're a first year student. Yes. Yes, I am. And what are you studying? I'm a finance major. Finance major. Where are you from? Uh, I grew up in uh, the Northeast Philadelphia. Went to high school in Bucks County, and now I uh, live in Delaware County. Uh huh. Do you have any experience with immigration at all? Uh, yeah. I'm actually a first gener first generation immigrant myself. Uh, my dad was born and raised in Dublin. Uh, he moved here when he was. 19 after he graduated college and uh, he's been here since. Yeah. D wait, he's from Dublin as in Dublin? Yeah, Dublin, yeah. Does he say Dublin? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he still has a very thick accent. All right, awesome, man. Well, well so I I'm gonna say a few things, okay, Sean, and then you will, um, and then we'll bring you back, we'll bring you back in, okay? It's really a bad idea to promote divisions in a society, okay? And immigration is a very divisive issue. And so these are, some, you know, some of the things that, 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 you know, these are some of the words that, that you know, President Trump used, that other people use, um, and certain, certainly some Democrats use it really just sort of, but... But, but really responding to, you know, infest, right? Like a verb like infest and pour into and referring to immigrants as animals and rapists and murderers. And you remember when, you probably don't remember, but because this was back in probably 2015 when Trump was running for election and he said that, you know, Mexico, it sends us the worst of its people, you know, the rapists, the murderers, the thugs, and so on and so forth. And that, that kind of language, my friends, is just never a good idea. And it, because what it does is it promotes 
a situation in which, in which it makes it very, very difficult to work out complex issues. And this is an incredibly complex issue. And you, you need to work it out. It's not simple. It's not black and white. And we need to work it out. And people all over the world are trying to work out the question of immigration. This is just a world of, of uh, it's a whirlwind of struggle for all societies everywhere. And it's been that way for thousands and thousands of years, and it will always be that way. And so one thing that I see, uh, if we go to the next slide, you know, when I when I see what it, what it leads to are, are, you know, things like this, right? Which is really just bizarre in and of the face of it. By the way, it, it is, it is uh, incorrect to put the flag on things like umbrellas, okay, my friends? So if you do that, when you say like it's disrespectful for people to kneel during the national anthem, it's also disrespectful to put a, an American flag on an umbrella or a bikini underwear or whatever you wanna put it on, your jock strap. I have no idea, but it's disrespectful. But anyway, looking at the, it leads to things like this, that kind of language. And my guess would be that these people who are you know mobilizing in this kind of way? If I if I had to, and again, this is coming from me, who spent you know years and years really digging into the complexities of these issues, and usually the things that seem to be the most black and white and the most straightforward are are the ones that are most complex. You know, like for example, where do we go when we die, right? So anyway, the, you know, this is like. First off, the absurdity of this, right? Which you don't, you wouldn't know, but I'm going to explain something. Like deport all illegals and build the wall nice and tall, and then that assimilate, assimilate, assimilate. The, the fact is today in the United States today, immigrants, including undocumented immigrants, strangely enough, are assimilating faster than immigrants at any point in US history. So even going back, you know, to way long before uh, Sean's f father came, I mean, going back to the turn of the century in the early 1900s, immigrants today are, are assimilating much faster than at any point in history and, and, uh, and oftentimes uh, undocumented immigrants. So, um, uh, so you, you can't keep people out. You just can't. That's just the nature of this. That's what part of the struggle is. You can build a wall as tall as you want. You won't keep all people out. Um, you, you can't let everyone in. You just can't let everyone in. Although the truth is not that many people want to come to the United States here. If they had a chance, we do these polls of people all over the world and not that many people actually want to come to the United States and live here permanently. I know it's probably surprising to some people who think the US is the greatest country in the world. Um, but the fact is not that many people, I mean, it's it's 140 million or so, but it's not the whole world. And the, the other thing is it's never a good, and this is something for those of you who, who think that we should just open the walls and let more who, undocumented people, they should just be allowed to live here and work because they're hardworking or whatever the case is. It's never a good idea to have people living underground outside of the, the legal structure, okay? It's just never a good idea. You inside your society, you need to be able to keep track of human beings. So you, you don't you don't want lots. Right now, we have about 10 to 11 million undocumented people living inside the United States. It's not a good idea to have that many people. OK, just I'm speaking as a sociologist. I'm speaking politically. I'm speaking socially. I'm speaking in a wide range of uh, from perspectives. That's not a good idea. OK, so uh, can you, we can bring Sean back in for a second, if we could. Hey, Sean, what's your, what's like your gut feeling about, uh, I'm going to keep calling it undocumented immigration. Okay. What's your, just your gut reaction to it? Like what's, uh, my gut reaction is, um, I can understand the, uh, the hostility with, with, uh, you know, uh, migrant workers here, um, because it, in a form, it is a sense of like outsourcing. So you no. Know, one of the major issues being cheaper labor, you know, understandably so, but they also have to make a living here. I personally don't have an issue with it. And I do think that there should be a due process of having them integrated it normally into our society, getting a citizenship. Um, but at the other, on the other hand, I can also understand where, you know, the opposers are coming from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's cool, dude. That's the best we can, you can, we can ever be, man. I, I get this. I see the struggle here, but I can understand this struggle. And 
that that's just hold just hold that that's a that's a nice place to be so have you ever thought about immigration from the perspective of american indians uh, ever... no no I, I personally haven't do you think your dad did when when he so i'm assuming your dad came legally right he did he win the, the lottery or something how'd he get here <laughs> um no he he had his last two hundred dollars and uh he just bought a one-way plane ticket never looked back and then he applied for a green card or yeah um whatchamacallit so he originally moved to boston um and the the carpet company he got a job with in, in boston uh got him a per permanent residency card so uh -huh, he's, got, yeah yeah he's not a okay. citizen um so he's he's living on a permanent uh, residency card right now got you okay so yeah so he um when i said won the lottery it's like you know we give out a certain number of uh, people apply just to it's like a lottery you know we apply there's a certain number every year number tens of thousands it changes every year uh, and then we just pick names and like, boom, you win. You want to come to the U.S.? And that's just how it's always, it's been that way for many, many years. A lot of societies do that, by the way. Um, so so the issue, it, what do you think Native Americans have to say about this issue? Or American uh, Indians? I, I can't imagine they'd be too happy. Um, I saw someone's comment in the Twitch chat saying uh, they don't understand how we can call people immigrants when we were the one squatting on their lands and, uh, you know, thinking from that perspective, um, yeah, no, I, I would have to agree. But it doesn't mean it's right though, right? You understand? Just because, right, just because American Indians say it, it's just like, you know, just if black and, if any my, person of a minority group says it, doesn't mean it's right. It just means if it's like, a, if it's an opinion we never heard before, it's like, well, hang on, let me think about this. Let me, let me see what they're saying. So we, so what, so t what the, what's the issue as far as you can see? Uh, as far as I can see, um, we took their land. They were in, in a sense, genocided. Um, a lot of them were killed in the process of us claiming their lands for our own Western expansion. Um, so that, that's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And once again, there, I'm not, I'm not pushing, this is, I'm not pushing a social justice perspective, right? Oh, because Native Americans have a, have an issue with everything that happened to them, right? So if we could put up this, this, uh, if y'all, it, it, Nish and Jeff, you can put up that cartoon, just because Native Americans are, uh, ha have an issue with some of this anti-immigration rhetoric, uh, that that doesn't mean that it's just it's so it's okay so we should just open the borders right but i you know i this cartoon somebody made it about 20 years ago um and you know it's time to reclaim you know this kind of allowed you know this guy here and it's like yeah that that's like okay well you're illegal right well but of course you know we don't we don't think about indigenous peoples as having ever really existed or even existing today. So put up the next slide and I'm gonna do the weatherman thing here. So here's a, one of the earliest maps of the United States. This is from 1685. And so, you know, we can see some of the, the colonies. First off, yeah, and uh, in 1497 is where Europeans first landed in North America and what is now, what is new, when, what is now New Finland. So, I mean, the Vikings probably came over this way, but you know, whatever. It, but. 1497. And so here's, this is this map. And now look how nothing, there's nothing here in the whole, the entire center of the country, right? So the idea is like, well, there's nobody here. I mean, there's not even a map. There are no borders, right? So the, the idea is like, this is a barren land and these brave immigrants came and they tamed it and they were able to, you know, really finally, you know, have this land and call it their own, right? Well, but hang on, but go to the next slide. Uh, th this is this is a slide of this is actually what the land would have looked like. Now, mind you, these these borders here are just drawn in by by scholars, historians of indigenous peoples in the America. But notice, there's no there's no border here between Canada and the U.S. There's no border here between Mexico and the U.S. These are more or less the nations, the most dominant nations all over these lands that had been living here for centuries and centuries, for millennia, actually. And so when the Europeans came over, they didn't come over to a barren land, right? They, they came over to a land where people were living and they came over with this idea that they were gonna take that land because they needed the land. And if we can go to the next slide, so that that's just pretty big first off, right? But the next slide is, so here's this, 
grand rush for the Indian territory. So this is from the late 1800s. And so the now this is now for new Europeans coming over from the US, like my ancestors, the ancestors of lots of people in the class. Now is the chance to procure a home in this beautiful country, country that was stolen, 15 million acres of land now open for settlement. This is land that's taken from indigenous peoples who were either killed or moved off. And this was the greatest genocide, the most longest, uh, the longest lasting, most extensive genocide in human history. And just look, this is all about the land. So these are these are the kinds of things that kind of get to go up, right? So people today, when I hear people who are really making these, these uh, you know, demands about, hey, and we're, and we're not gonna do that next slide. So you can bring Sean back in. Um, when I hear when so Sean, when I hear people, uh, you know, being really adamant about undocumented or illegal immigration, I I just I'm always asking my Native American friends or American Indian friends, like turning thumbs, like, wait, wh what what do you guys think? Like, what are you thinking? Like, who's illegal or what is this? And and, and like that that I'm illegal at some level, right? I mean, maybe I'm not. I mean, I'm not really because I I was born. I got a I got a pass, I, you know, I got my birth certificate, I had immediate citizenship, I got this and that, but somewhere if I go back in time, some ancestor of mine is who first came here was illegal from the eyes of people who were living here. And like we, we, you know, we move forward in life and we don't look backwards, but it's like, well, what if we did look backwards? What if we asked them and what would that mean? And how, what does that mean? And that kind of thing. And then just complicates shit in a way that none of us want to be complicated, to be frank with you. So go, I don't know, go maybe a little further. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really have a, go ahead. What question do you have for me? Uh, my question would be is like, do you think that our immigration issue is comparable to that of Europe with the uh, the mass migration of uh, Muslims from the Middle East over to, to Europe? And, and do you think that we can learn from that in any way? Wait, wait, say, so wait, say that again. That's really speak louder if you could, because yeah. Um, I, I was wondering that if you think that we could learn from the mass migration of, of Muslims from the Middle East into Europe, because they're having a, an immigration problem as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's a it continue. There's a lot we can learn, and I think some of the origin of both uh, streams of immigration are very similar, right? And to a, to a degree, some of the uh, what do, what do you think is a similarity, by the way? Let me ask you. Do you have uh, an idea? This, uh, like between us and, and, and Europe? Yep, yep. Um, I think a similarity would be is obviously, um, you know, foreign citizens coming into our country. I think the biggest difference is that a lot of European countries are, are doing it better. Um, I know at least in Ireland that they actually have a, a process in place for granting citizenship to those uh, immigrants. Um, a lot of them actually open businesses, especially in Dublin city center. It's a big thing, yep. uh, especially with the whole Brexit thing, you know, Ireland's property values have skyrocketed. Um, so I think, I think that personally, you know, the fact that they actually have a process for it and they're not just being put into, you know, internment camps and stuff like that is definitely something we could learn from. Yeah. Yeah. So here's an issue right there, right? So Ireland for one brought in lots of immigrants from Eastern Europe, in particular Poland, um, and so many, so many immigrants, right? Because they needed labor and the Irish, you know, because there's so much out migration from Ireland, people like your dad, bro, who like it, in his generation, like so many Irish left. And then like when he leaves, they got to replace him with somebody. Ireland's a small country and you need labor. And so now we're going to replace it. So we're going to bring somebody in, let's say from Poland to do the job that your dad would have done. And, and so one of the things that we see here is that, uh, that you know, the, some of the European nations have brought many, many immigrants in because they need them to fill positions. Mm -hmm. And so similar to the United States, we bring a certain number of immigrants in, but we also allow undocumented immigrants into the United States. The reason we don't just automatically round people up because you think we could, right? Just round people up, man, send them home. But we don't do that because we, certain groups in the United States, i.e. business in particular, want them here. And so it's like, okay, uh, you know, and so that's part of the, that's part of the issue that we struggle with. Yeah, I yeah. mean, um, I know some businesses are actually 
going to them instead of bringing them to here um, just for tax purposes. I forget uh, which company is, is opening a headquarters in Mexico City um, rather than bringing in illegal undocumented mm-hmm. immigrants. They're actually just building businesses there because it's more tax efficient apparently. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. Yeah, definitely. It, it is a it, lots of lots of stuff it's so man well the one thing that you mentioned also a similarity with europe and the united states uh i'm gonna we're gonna talk about with our our next volunteer but um but the but the issue is for me let me just summarize this whole piece this whole segment for me when i think about immigration just as as a as as a human as a as an american as a white american as a as an american who has ancestors who were immigrants at some point right um i i just feel a certain humility right I, again i don't just because in american indians say x i don't automatically say oh well it's true because they said it but it reminds me that i shouldn't try to be the know-it-all I shouldn't try to, maybe I shouldn't, I should be a little more humble, a little more open to seeing the complexity of the issues. Um, because, uh, because I too am in this place that's really deeply disturbing um, to know that this, the land that I'm standing on was the land that was taken from other people. The land that you're on right now, the land that your home is on, right? That you're, you know, you're, that for all of us, right? It's, t- it's taken from other people. And just because it was many generations ago, just because I've forgotten about it, it doesn't mean that they have forgotten about it. You know what I mean? Like if I take, you know, so Sean, like if you steal my wallet and you give the wallet to your your child, you know, you steal money from, you steal my house, right? And you give it to your children and I can't get it back. And I tell my children, hey, that guy, Sean stole my house and he gave it to his kids. And then your kids give it to their kids and then my grandkids know about it and it's like hey well that was our house you know and now this sean's grandkids have it and like what well, doesn't make it by the time it gets to our grandkids it doesn't make it okay just because it happened a long time in the past it's still like nothing's going to happen because nobody's going to come along and say hey sean's grandkids you got to give them the house back that's never going to happen but it still is a problem so that's i think where i'm always at you know like let me just be a little humble on this. Yeah, oh, definitely. I do have to agree. Um, you know, and, and I think a, a bigger part of that is is the uh, our attitude towards immigrants. Um, I know my dad experienced a lot of like hateful things happen to him when he first moved here, especially now being in, in the corporate world. Uh, he still takes classes to help get rid of his accent so people don't hear it when he's in meetings, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, you know, he's been called like Meg Patty, stuff like that you know, mm-hmm. potato farmer, really anything. Yeah. Uh, I think like you were saying with the whole, you know, stop Asian hate, um, I think that's that's the real issue. Uh, rather yeah. than us squatting on, you know, not our land. Um, I think it's, it's the mindset of us towards immigrants. Yeah, it's a mindset. And, you know, we're in a class. Where, yeah. Hey, hey. Anyway, Sean. Thanks for thanks for that. I love your I love your comments. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Um, just a final thing. And this is, goes out to Sean. You know, the Irish experienced some of the worst discrimination of all white groups in the United States. And in fact, even at the toward the in the mid nineteenth century, uh, a lot of times the the big uh, plantations would bring uh, boatloads or trainfuls of Irish workers into the South to work in the really dangerous areas like the swamps where people where they were going to lose a lot of people from yellow fever because they didn't they couldn't afford to and didn't want to lose to have their own slaves die. And so they would bring Irish workers because an Irish life had own, own no value to it whatsoever. Um, and so, you know, that's a just that kind of history. Hey, why don't we um Why don't we, anyway, that was awesome. I really appreciate that. So listen, class, remember, this is a thinking class. We're here to think. So Lauren, why don't you put your your, uh, camera on and hop in. Lauren, where are you you from? Uh, I'm from Princeton, New Jersey. Princeton, New Jersey. Yeah, the great state of New Jersey. All right, (laughs) awesome. Uh, From the city itself or the town itself? Uh, No, I'm like... 15 20 minutes south but i went to high school in princeton so i just yeah. always say princeton yeah it's easier all right we'll yeah. top that up make sure you do it 
Yeah, I'm looking at it. Right what now. do you what do you know about the border wall? Um, actually, my school started this thing where in May you do one class and one class only. And I did a class on border and immigration issues. It was called Immigration and Identity. So I went to the Arizona border, met with a bunch of people across the border into Mexico. So I know like a little bit more than I used to about the issue. That's it. Awesome. You know, you know far more than probably 90% of all Americans just because you did that. You, you know what I mean? So yeah. what do you, what do you, how much wall is there? Like, do you, do you have any idea how long the border is with Mexico? Do you remember? I don't remember the exact length, but I know that the actual wall blocks, like not, not even close to the full wall. Like not, it doesn't really help that much where it's at right now. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. Right. So a lot of times we see this with politicians, they make these big proclamations because they want to get voted in. And, you know, we, we go with the simple ideas. People vote for simple ideas when they think something's really simple and it can get done really easily. That's who we vote for, because of course we do. Right. Oh, this is really easy. We're going to build a wall and like, OK, got it. I want to vote for that person. Nobody's going to vote for me. Now, I would be imagine me like on a stage talking about issues and trying to be elected. I'd be like, well, you know, I went in. It's, it's complicated over here because you got these 15 issues that come into play. And then like, but I can see this point, too. And like. Well, we need to sit down and have some really valuable conversations. It's like people like get this MF or out of here, right? So do you have any idea? So okay, so it's it's almost two thousand miles long, the the border with Mexico, which is pretty long, right? Do you have any idea? So you all you know is that a, a very small amount of the wall has been built. Do you know how much yeah. got built during the Trump administration? I don't know if any got built. Yeah, a little bit got built. Okay, yeah, I don't know. I here. We'll, we'll put the, we'll put the, we're going to put the numbers up and I'm going to, well, hang on. Let me ask you before we do that. Do you know, what's the problem with building a border wall with Mexico? Uh, I know that the cost was like a lot and. What, why do you think it was but, so costly? Do you remember why? Well, the fact that it was so long and I think the materials that they were using to build it. Yeah, and where they're building it. Here, let me show you a couple of things, right? So put, first off, put, put, if you could put those numbers up. Uh, so about 19, almost 2,000 miles, and since 2017, so there were about 406 miles, a little over 400 miles that were actually old wall that got reinforced. It was just fencing and they reinforced it, right? And that was primarily because that was the easiest part to get to. And there's 47 miles of new fencing. So really not very much has ha happened during the Trump administration at all, right? But a lot, actually. I mean, that that's a lot. You can't do this thing overnight. So on one hand, you could say not very much happened. But on the other hand, actually, a lot happened because, you know, we're, we're like a, almost a quarter finished with this thing, right? But here's the issue. Show a couple. I want to show you all a couple of these photos. The re One of the reasons it's so costly is because, look, at this is the land. Look, they in order to get this wall, they had to barrel through a mountain by by the way for native for american indians all this land is sacred so when you blow through a mountain like that you're blowing up a sacred mountain so understand that can be an issue and look you got it not only do you are you you have to get down here all the materials have to come down here all of the construction materials the the, the you know the bulldozers all the equipment every this is not land this is not flat land this is not open desert where you just drive across the desert and you say like okay we got this so go to the next slide and we'll show a couple of these here's another here's a piece of wall that got built look notice there's no wall here and there's no wall over here just this little section of wall got built now i have no idea why the hell that got built as it did but it did and here it is i don't know what it's doing it's not doing anything really but but understand look at this right when so when you tell americans hey we're just going to build a wall um it first off we're going to build 2000 plus not just 2000 but we're going to build four to five thousand miles of roads because it's not just the road along the wall you have to have all the roads getting down there and then and then here showing uh wait hang on and and so there's so this is this is one of the problems okay back to lauren lauren where are people coming from who are the people coming what do you remember okay um so we went to ranchers um who have property along the arizona border 
Yeah. And when we were talking to them, they deal with a lot of the drug cartels. Yeah. And they've had um, drugs like dropped from planes onto their property. Yeah. And they've had run-ins with a lot of drug cartels crossing. So that is a majority of like what I saw in like the middle, I think, or like not in as common areas. Yep. But then we also went to certain which, water which, drops. Wait, which by the way is a huge problem, right? Drug cartel. Let's but that's not even like it's a holy shit problem. But go ahead. You also oh, did yeah. what? It, it was bad. We also went to like water drop places. Yep. Where the certain um, groups go and like drop water, and we went there as well, which that was a big problem that we learned about. But because um, and why why is that a problem? Well, so. Half of the problem was like, okay, half the problem is like not encouraging illegal crossing, Mm -hmm. but kind of saying like, it's okay. And then half of the problem was also that there is known groups and sometimes even border patrol that goes to the known places where they drop the water and slash the water bottles, empty the cans and stuff. So basically they force the people traveling to like go starving or be totally dehydrated, which Mm -hmm. is just like unethical in my opinion. So that caused a big problem as well. Well, yeah, right. So it wouldn't be unethical if you think like, well, we're going to slash, we're going to empty all this water out that people are putting on humanitarian reasons, right? We're going to put it out. We're going to help people because otherwise, because you don't want people to die in the desert. But if you do that and then more people come, then you're enabling it, right? So somehow you got to stop all that. So people back where it, in, in the places of origin hear about that and then they don't come, but that's not exactly what happens. So let me be clear about something. The drug cartels are an issue always, right? The vast majority of the vast, vast majority of people coming, however, are not in drug cartels. They are people who are um, economic and sometimes political migrants, right? We're going to talk about mm-hmm. that in a, in a little bit, but very much economic migrants, right? So then the question to you, I have for you is, okay, you got really poor people. What's their stories? What's their st- Um, I, we met with a transgender woman who was illegally in the country and she was really poor in her country. Uh, I think she was from um, El Salvador or something mm-hmm. and sh- people were out to kill her and she knew that it was dangerous and she crossed like I think three times even though she knew the risk of like dying and stuff and we talked with some other illegal immigrants and a lot of them would have come over no matter what because whatever situation they were escaping they they had a chance a high chance of dying either way so a lot of them were really in search of like a job or just came over alone just to send money back to their families. Like they had, you know, like three children or something and their wife back home that they wanted to send money to. And they were going to cross as many times as it would have taken yeah. to be able to get that life for their family. So here's one of the, let me talk about this for a second. Okay. J- hey, can you put up this next slide? So I'm just going to talk, say a couple of things about Guatemala. In the past couple of years, I've been really invested in this, in the issue, what's going on in Guatemala. So the, here's, this is Guatemala. This is lush land in Guatemala when the rains are coming and everything's happening, right? But climate change has created these droughts in Guatemala that are really unprecedented. And so here's, here's another slide. Um, so these, you're, you mentioned p- people who are really poor, right? So here's, Here's like about 1 million people in the central highlands in Guatemala are in a, in a deep food crisis. So those, the corn, what you saw on the previous slide, this is what it looks like here, right? So now we have, huh, from there to here. And, and go to the next slide. And what, what we see here in this area, uh, Chimaltenango, 67% suffer from chronic malnutrition. So here's this family, right? Chronic malnutrition. So what's this guy, what's he going to do? He's got to feed his family. Like, what's he going to do? And what would you do? What would I do? Right? What would any of us do? Right? Uh, including the people who are, you know, holding the flags up saying like, you know, build the wall, build it higher, build it taller. Really? What would we do? Well, we're going to do what this guy did. Doesn't make it, doesn't make it like, well, just because 
he's starving and his family's starving. We should just open the doors and let him in. But understand, that's what it's, where it's coming from. And that makes this this real complex moral issue. If you go, if we go to the next slide, because um, chronic malnutrition. So here's here's the wife and children of this next gentleman. And that's their house there. This is a Guatemalan family. And here's this gentleman right here, right? So here's the father. And go to the next next slide. And one of the things that I will say is for most Americans, look at him, right? So a lot of people who have never talked, this is his land. So look at his corn. He's going to feed his family on this corn. And not only is he going to feed his family, he's actually going to collect the seeds to plant the next harvest all from this corn, which is not going to happen. So look, what I would say about him is, see, I know this guy. Like, I don't know him personally, but I know him. I've met hundreds and hundreds of him. People who look like him, I've spoken with him, I've been in their houses, I see them. I see them not only in, in, the, in South America, but I see them here in the United States. I talk to them. He's not dangerous to me. If you only listen to, to you know, they send their, their worst of their people, their rapists, their drug dealers, their criminals, their everything, then, then that's who you're going to see with this guy. He's going to look really dangerous. He's not dangerous to me. He's a man, he's a he's a husband, he's a father, he's a son, he's a human being, probably a Christian. He's a human being who's trying to survive and trying to help his family survive. And he, and in all likelihood, he's as nice of a human being as anybody that I would pick out on the street or anyone I would pick out from my class. And 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 when I that's what I see when I see him. And so one of the problems when we create these this rhetoric about and we can bring lauren back on when we create this rhetoric about immigration then we only see somebody like him as a bad person and then the question lauren to you is let me ask you this question wait hang on what do you think about that you met some of people like him right i i did and for us like my teacher did a very good job at showing us both sides telling us every side of the story we met with border patrol you know met with other people as well but the hardest thing was the fact that when we met with the people who owned the land, they had a lot of run-ins with the drug cartels and the really dangerous people and the people who like pointed guns at them. So they had that mindset of, well, we need to stop everything. They offered their land to border patrol so that they could be closer to the border and have like either thing. They were going to charge them like $2 a year. But then when we went to, we actually went to court and watched people get deported as well. And a majority of those people were like desperate for like their lives. Like they really just wanted to get a job and stuff. And I feel like it's really hard to look at it or really determine even like at the end of the mm -hmm. trip, we were all just confused because Good. there's so many issues with it. Like you can't say like build a wall or not build a, build a wall or change the laws or not change them because it's so complicated. Like there are the drug cartels, but there's also yeah. the innocent people who are just trying to get a better life. Yeah. We're just trying to earn money. So it's like one of those things where like you can't really identify immigrants as one group of people because mm -hmm. it'll never be one group of people. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's awesome. It's awesome to hear that, to hear you say that, because it's really nice to hear you say you left more confused because you should leave more confused. I'm more confused today than I was yesterday, 10 years ago, 20 years ago when I was your age. I'm way more confused now. I used to think I had answers, and now I realize I was just an idiot back then. So, uh, so here, I mean, I'm still an idiot because a year from now, I'll look back to me today, and I'll think, "Oh, you were still an idiot," you know. So, like, that's okay. That's good. Um, that's why I teach, by the way. So, if you can't do anything useful, then you teach, right? So, but my question is. What responsibility do you think the United States has for the conditions in Central America and in Mexico and in South America? Like, do you know how much of our history of U.S. history and foreign policy in these countries are you aware of that you could say, well, here's the ways one of here's let, let me list out like four or five reasons why things are the way they are in Central America. Okay. Um, I do remember learning. We learned about one thing because, you know, like our, we sat down one night and discussed what we saw for the day and stuff. And we asked everyone like what we would change about the immigration laws. And we had learned that day about when people came over to like California to help in the fields and they would like pick the raspberries or something or whatever it was or strawberries 
and then they'd go back to Mexico for the night and they'd only like work in America yeah. or yeah. in the U S and we talked about that a lot and how that probably definitely affected the relationship between like the, like our country and Mexico and stuff and how that like allowed for a lot of crossing and understanding and I, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. but again, caused more confusion, but that was yeah. pretty much like the only big thing that I remember definitely mm-hmm. knowing about the interaction between the two mm-hmm. countries, but. Well, okay. Awesome. It's good that you, again, you, now you know, you still know more than, you know, 80% of other Americans probably. I would say this, uh, it, it's, there is a, there's a long history. And so it's really worth doing a little bit of investigation into how the conditions in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Mexico, how the conditions came to be. And what re- we're not 100% responsible, but the degree to which we are is, is really worth, worth looking at. Because, you know, when you, create cert- when you help to create certain conditions for people and then we look at them and we point fingers at them for how it is, and it's like, wait a minute, there's three fingers pointing back at us. You know, like we need to, we could look at that. So when I see people coming from like in Guatemala, I know the history of Guatemala. I'm like, well, we probably should be thinking about some of that history. But um, hey, listen, yo, I'm so awesome that you came on at this, on this, on this segment. It's really cool to know, to, to have that. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, very good. So thus far, Sean and Lauren, awesome man. Hey, we have a we have another a, a special guest. I'm gonna I'm gonna if we could if you could put the the photo up. Yeah, there we go, man. There he is. Hey, wait, actually, okay. So Brian, you're gonna I'm gonna have you explain what this photo is when you come on. Uh, Esquire, there he is. And then and then I want you to and then go ahead and put up the next photo that I found. Uh, somewhere i don't know where it was so you can uh yeah bring brian on go ahead and tell us what what's what's anyway uh hang on we're gonna bring you on in a second um live there we are yo welcome man hey welcome welcome back to social 119. no it's 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 great thank you so much for uh you know for for this opportunity and that it was flashbacks um so that first photo was a SOCH 119 class project back from, I think that was either 99 or 2000. I, I, I don't know quite which, but um, we had to take a picture with somebody of, an, of another race or another ethnicity and then bring that photo home with us and say, hey, this is my, this is my girlfriend, this is my boyfriend, um, you know, if, as an experiment. Uh, and then you know, the, sec- the second, I mean, it, 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 second photo is, is uh, my wife um, from a couple years back, a couple summers ago. <laughs> so there it goes. Yeah. All right. Awesome, man. Uh, yeah, that was actually a really risque project. Remember that? Like, do you remember what happened in your family? Was it? Did you have a cool conversation? Yeah. You know, it, it was. Uh, Wait, so you went to your family like at the Thanksgiving dinner table and said, hey, this is my girlfriend. I want to show you. Yeah, my my parents never really had much concern. They they always just wanted to make sure I was happy. Uh, mm-hmm. my, my grandmother, I remember having more of a, you know, she more of an interrogation. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I have to say, you know, all in all, uh, for, you know, again, it's a different time. I mean, Times different world, man. But hey, was, well, listen. So tell tell. So why are you here, man? So you've done some work with with uh, with immigration, right? You and I were talking, and and the and the issue is that the, the issue of children in detention came up, and you said, "Hey, I'm doing some pro bono work. Um, if you want to have a conversation, can you can you tell us what you were doing?" Sure. Um, I, I was driving one day. I heard on the radio uh, people looking for attorney volunteers who can help take cases for uh, families that were separated uh, at the southern border. Um, it was a uh, pro bono organization. I, I had time and I, I contacted the organization, went through a training, got a team of attorneys at my law firm together, and, and we um, we took a, we took a case. We uh, a father and daughter that uh, left El Salvador, 
um, you know, I can get into detail. I mean, essentially, it was it was an asylum application, but you know, they, they have a they have a story. But but it was a lot of what's being said here, and, and just to echo a lot of what what Lauren said, um, you know, the it's it's a situation where you know, and, and those photos you put up as well, the farmer and his family. I mean, it's just uh, you know, uh, Mario was a was a police. He was a he was a police officer, former police officer, who got involved in a in a shootout with MS thirteen testified against the gang. The gang followed his daughter, his nine or eight year old daughter, uh, took pictures, came to his house in the middle of the night. I mean, he really, in addition to not having uh, money um, and having worked very hard all his life to actually enter uh, you know, the police training in, in El Salvador to be part of the national police force um, while his friends were doing other things. I mean, it took a lot of uh, integrity, hard work. I mean, he's a, he was a you know, really an, an incredible guy. And he, what he went through, what his daughter went through, what they went through, what their family's going through. I mean, it, it's just, uh, you know, it, it's so an he, honor to be able to, so, to represent. So they threatened him and, in El Salvador, they thre- MS-13. So they threatened him. And so he came up through Mexico and he got to the border. He crossed over the border and then went directly to La Migra. Turned himself in. Uh, understood that there's a legal process um, for asylum and followed that legal process. Uh, didn't try to sneak into the country, didn't try to evade uh, capture. He and his daughter walked up to uh, border, border Patrol and said, we're here to seek asylum and, you know, put himself and his daughter and their lives at the mercy of the U.S. government. Mm. So... So asylum cases, and then you've worked, or you, your colleagues have worked in some of the cases with children who are in detention. So let's- yeah, my, my client, uh, the, the young girl, Elena, was in detention. I mean, she yeah. was, she was the, the family, she and Mario were separated from each other immediately. Uh, she was sent, eight-year-old child by herself, uh, flown to New York, to a facility in New York while Mario was in a, uh, sent to New Mexico. And this was 67 days they were apart. So who uh, was with her for 67 days? There are, you know, as you might imagine, the, the Border Protection, U.S. Immigration Services, ICE, uh, there are case workers that are assigned, you know, it's, I mean, you, they were essentially jail wardens more than anything, but try to just make sure the population is where it needs to be and everybody's accounted for. As soon as you cross over, you enter the system, you're given an a, an alien number or an A number. Yeah. Um, they had consecutive A numbers and that's all that mattered to the government. Yep. Okay. I got you. I got you. So, okay. So, hey, let, so let me do this for a second. I want to bring on uh, our, our Stephen, our ne- if you guys can bring, Bring Stephen and Brian on at the same time, and then the three of us are going to have a conversation. So, Stephen, where where are you? You, you are uh, a law minor, right? Isn't that what you said? Pre-law minor or something like that? Uh, it's like a business law minor, but it's within like the business school. So, yeah. Dude, awesome, man. So you might be in Brian's position one day. We'll Maybe. see. All right. All right. So, uh, so do you have any questions for him yet? I mean, we're going to keep talking. Do you have any any questions yet of anything that came up? Uh, throughout the whole thing? Yeah, just from what we just said. Anything? Oh, uh, I just think it's pretty interesting. Uh, kind of sounds like some behind the scenes sort of stuff. Okay. All right. So, okay. So hang tight. So I want you to come up with a couple questions that you have. So, uh, Brian, so one of the things, let's talk about children in detention. How, how is it that children end up here? Like, why, how do they end up at the border? You gave us one example of a gentleman who is seeking political asylum because he's in danger of being assassinated in El Salvador for, uh, for testifying against a, a, a gang, right? Um, how do children end up here, man? What are, what are, because, for example, in February, February last month, there were almost 10,000 young immigrants, young migrants, young, and when we say young, when we say children, we, we, that means the vast majority are 15, 16, and 17 years old who end up at the border and they're in detention. Like, how is that? Where are they coming from and why are they coming? I mean, there's, uh, you know, everybody has their own story, but I, I think what you tend to see is, uh, you know, 
it's the same with with Elena as a young as a young girl, young woman uh, in that area. There's a there's a there's a sex trait that the gang also would have kidnapped her and she would you know be sold into a, a form of slavery. That that affects plenty of young young girls. Uh, young boys are are heavily recruited by the gang. Uh, you know, the, the, there's not a lot of places to go for help. Uh, the, the government, the police force, I mean, they're, they're, they're powerless. And, you know, it really comes down to what is the best hope for this child's future. And a lot of times it's parents saying, look, we can't afford to leave the land. We, you know, we're too old, we're too sick. We can't do this. But there's a better life for you if you are able to to do you know certain things. There, there's a number of reasons. A lot of it is just. I mean, it, it really is at this point in my mind. And let me just say, I mean, my opinions and what I say here is mine own. That doesn't necessarily uh, the opinion of my law firm. But but it's uh, it, it comes down to economics. It comes down to economic uh, insecurity uh, and just a hope for a better life. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's not. You know, we can get into this too, but but this isn't illegal immigration. There's nothing illegal about what's being done in these in these circumstances. You know, and and I think that's really a, an unfortunate uh, phrase that has taken hold. Is this illegal immigrant, illegal alien? Um, it's just false. Uh, you know, it's just false. The, the, and if I may, just for one second, the U.S. Constitution, the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment are very specific, and they ensure certain rights and protections, not just for citizens. Citizens are entitled to privileges and immunities of citizenship. That, that's in the 14th Amendment. But the Constitution provides due process, equal protection to persons. And due process means that there's a, a, a process that is followed according to law. If somebody's going to take your life, liberty, or property, you're entitled to, these, to this process. So it, it, the Constitution doesn't say that's only for citizens; it's persons. And last I checked, um, you know, it, it, it comes down to this sort of this, this fundamental misunderstanding of what is illegal and, and why. Coming across, uh, crossing a border and, and uh, declaring, uh, you know, that you're seeking asylum is accepted under international law. It, United States uh, asylum laws uh, require that. There's nothing illegal about so this type. Of no, I got so the issue though is pol economic political asylum is different than economic necessity or something, right? And that's what we're battling over here. Well, right. So, like, so, it's when, not so, so then the issue becomes. Hang, hang, let me say. So then the issue becomes. Okay, so if someone's coming because they're afraid of a being, you know, abducted into sexual slavery or abducted, any number being killed and and or afraid of starving to death, right? Th that's where we, we start, that's where we're starting to parse through this, right? Am I right? And that's what people are struggling with so much. Correct. So asylum is intended for folks who have a credible fear that, that stems from something about them, something that's called immutable, something that can't be changed about them that's yeah. persecution or, mm -hmm. or, or fear of persecution. Okay. So, and persecution takes several forms: uh, withholding, yep. Yep. Law, withholding food, withholding economic opportunity. I so, do have a question. Yep, go ahead, Mom. So, like, it sounds like there's like a, a line between like law and political, and then like the humanity side. Do you have a like a specific line where this doesn't become like a law problem? It becomes just like a humility, and is that is your view different than your law your law firms? No, and I, I say that, and that's a good question. Um, I, you know, obviously I speak for myself. I, I have, you know, I, these are my cases. I can't be speaking for every attorney in my law firm or every, every you know, person that, that we work with or that we represent. But I, I handled this pro bono case. I, I have the experience, you know, going to ICE, you know, for a year and dealing with, with these people. The way I see it is, you know, the law is, and for somebody who wants to study the law, the law, the answer is always, it depends. You know, what does the law say? How does the law, uh, what, what does the law require? And it's always a fact-based determination. It, it, it's going to depend on the situation. So, you know, there are, I think what, what ends up happening is you get this loud sort of vocal 
characterization of people as being, you know, criminals or rapists or, uh, you know, gang members who want to infest the streets with drugs, when in reality, the far, the vast majority of these folks have legitimate asylum claims, uh, are, 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 you know, fleeing persecution, fleeing uh, situations that, you know, and Sam mentioned a little while ago about, you know, the policies uh, in, in the Western Hemisphere, and especially stemming from the United States and, and over the, the decades that, uh, and, you know, dating back to the early 1900s and 1800s and U.S. policy towards Central and South America, you know, it causes a lot of the problems that these countries are, are facing. I mean, I woke up, I woke up this morning in a certain place because that's where I went to sleep last night. And there's this process of things that flow. And we're, we're dealing today with the ramifications of things that have happened a long time ago. So mm -hmm. we, when I deal with my clients, I look at their case I, and I give them a, a recommendation of, you know, even with this pro bono matter, you have, they have a valid asylum claim and they have every right to petition the government, to file their pleadings, to do what they need to do to appear before a judge and have their claim heard. Not just not just my clients, but thousands of other people that are similarly situated that have the same type of situation, fleeing the same type of area. So it, it intertwines. It's it's not just that the law is one thing and then the the humanity of everything is something else. You know what, what it comes down to. The law says for asylum, do you have a credible fear? Are you afraid? And if so, is it credible? You're just pretending to be afraid. And if you're able to demonstrate that you have fear and it's you know it's actual fear, then you go to the next. Well, what is that fear? What does it stem from? Is it something about you that you can't change? Or is it that, you know, you, you know, I don't know, stole the mayor's mail one day or whatever, like, or, or, or that you're, or that you don't have food on your table and you could go get a different job or something. I, I don't know. Correct. Yeah. You know, 85% of the children who are coming are coming from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. So here, here's a shot of children behind, you know, behind fencing, right? So these are, you know, and then look at the, here, here's another one. Um, yeah, so there we go. Um, here, here's an, a detention center. So these are, you know, um, some detention centers are just children. Others are children and adults. Um, and those, by the way, it's, it's, you know, it's cold, right? So, and next one. Um, so here's another detention center. Notice, notice the, the, the soccer, the, the, the you know, the, it's a soccer field, right? So it's like these are people that could be living, they could be there a long, long, long time. And so it's not like we're not just throwing, some of them, we're not going to just throw you behind bars. We're going to provide something, but nonetheless, right? So Stephen, what question do you have when you see those photos? You got all these children in detention and adults, right? But now we're just going to focus on children. So you can, what, what question do you have? I, my question is, is how can these like how can these people i just still i'm still caught up on that line between like the law and like helping people like i find it so hard like, how can you distinguish like who gets this help and who doesn't get this help when it looks like so many people need it and they're in terrible situations like how do you like it's so hard to like how do you how can you decide that who's the who's to receive these benefits and asylums and stuff. Yeah. Brian, you, do you I have, have this same question. I have the same question. I have I wish I had an answer. Yeah, that's I the know. I think that's really going to be the point is there the to find answers to, with such limited resources, not just in this country, but around and there's limited resources and, and you're hundred percent right, Stephen. I mean, there are a lot of deserving people. How, so, how no, go ahead. Go ahead. Say just, how, how, how do you, where do you, where do you get the resources? You know, you have, how do you, how do you. So Brian, listen, I'm going to walk, through, I want to say a couple of things and I want you to respond as a lawyer and Stephen, I want you to come up with a question. All right. So one of the problems is, and this is the issue with children, y'all, right? When children arrive at the border, they might be with an adult and, you know, we separate them, right, from adults and children. And one reason is, well, we don't know that the adult is their family member. The, the adult might say, this is my son or this is my nephew or this is whoever, but my brother. But we don't know that, first off. So now they get separated, right? We can start running DNA tests on the border, but that's a lot of DNA tests to run on kids. 
Then the, the child comes, and let's say the child has somebody who's already here in the United States, and let's say they're living without documentation, and the child comes, well, I, my father's living in Chicago. And then the, uh, the immigration can't just get on the phone and call the father in Chicago, and here's his phone number. They're gonna call the father in Chicago and say, hey, your son is here, come pick him up, because the father can't come and pick him up because he'll get picked up and sent back home. So now we're dealing with this child, and Brian, this is where I want you to point, like. The law in the United States is like, you can't just turn a child loose. We can't send the child back, like go go back to Guatemala, walk through all of Mexico and get back to Guatemala because of the children, these are children, right? And so our our society is saying, we can't do that. We can't just send, put the child on a plane and say, hey, the easiest thing would be to just go see your father in Chicago because we don't want to take care of you. Like he'll take care of you, right? But we can't do that. And so we're stuck in this place of like, so you got all these children, tens of thousands of children. And then, so what do we do? We just put them in detention, put them behind a cage, put them where we go, where else are we gonna put them? You know, you know what I mean? Like, what, what are we gonna do? So this becomes like this thing. We, I, we don't have like Hilton hotels and daycare centers, right? Like, fuck, I, Brian, so what? Is, so what, this has been a, 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 a perpetual problem. I mean, the Flores settlement, Flores settlement, is a it's a was a class action lawsuit that was filed in the 80s in the 1980s and this settlement agreement i think was dated to the late 90s and this settlement agreement was supposed to be replaced by regulations that immigration and naturalization services was supposed to write by 2001 well guess what the ins doesn't even exist anymore that got that got terminated it was part of the department of justice after 2001, you have the Department of Homeland Security, which now oversees U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and, and Border Protection. And so, this settlement agreement still is is the is the operative document, and there and it's not very powerful. It's not a law. It's not a regulation. It's just it's a it's a court enforced settlement agreement. And, and all this says, provides which for, which forces us, which says to the American government. When children arrive on your soil, you have to take care of them? Is that what it Correct. says? It, it sets a baseline, minimum standards, using this principle, what's the best interest of a child? So it basically says you, you, you're gonna detain a child within 20 days. That child has to be provided for. You know, either sent to a, a, a parent, a guardian, uh, a, a sponsor, or an organization, or a facility, a licensed facility, that complies with the minimum standards that are laid out by this settlement agreement. You have to have access to a toilet. You have to be able to, you know, get fresh water. I mean, these are minimum standards. And the problem is the government, whichever administration it is, it's, you know, it's been going on since the 80s and prior to that, there needs to be, this needs to be addressed. And that's really what we're stuck in is we don't have a system in place that makes any sense. We have lives hanging in the balance. And we have a lot of good people working, you know, at border protection and in ICE, and you know that that want to do the right thing, that want to enforce the laws fairly and and equitably, and and want to make sure that these kids are taken care of. But when you look in the bank account, what's available for that? There's nothing, and yeah. it's it's a it's a perpetual problem. And you're you're right. It's under when you know it's a crisis when it's politically convenient, and it's a situation when it's not. And it's, it's just, it needs to be addressed. And, and, you know, that's part of this is just, you know, the pro bono opportunities that are out there for attorneys yeah. and just for community members to get involved and to reach out and to try to find ways to, to help. Them. So I'm going to say something. And then Stephen, I want you to ask a question. So like when I think about Biden the other day, two nights ago, he said he spoke to the, to people in Mexico, Central America, South America. And he basically said, stop coming. This is his solution, right? Just like, which I, I don't know what else you do, but he's just a stop coming. You know, I'm going to follow like things haven't changed since the Trump administration. So st because people have this idea, well, Trump's no longer in power, Biden's in power. So like, okay, we can come and we'll cross the border. We'll hear an asylum claim, whatever it is. Right. And Biden is saying stop coming. But people don't, when you're starving, or when you're, you know, your life is at risk, or you're starving, or you're hungry, you're trying to feed your children. Remember, 67% of Guatemalans, hang on, hang on, I'm going to go to, let's go to camera one for a second, right? 67% of Guatemalans are 
in that particular region are malnourished. It's like, what are you going to just stop coming? Like, you know, I'm not going to not come just because of that, you know? So, Stephen, do you have a question? And if um, you don't have a question, I have a question for you. Um, my question, you kind of answered it, but I thought of it while like he was saying like, what's the best, what's the better way to pull our resources to help these people? And what's like the most efficient way to pay for it? Because the average person wants to help these people, but the average person also doesn't want to be the one paying for it. So, so listen, like, I want to ask two questions. you that question. What would you do? Um... You're, king, you're do? king of the world, man. You just became king of the United States. What would you do? You, um, even a, we would never let a 76ers fan be king of the United States. Let me just say <laughs> that out front. But nonetheless, right? Ah, oh, man. Tough question. What would I do? Um, I guess I would... I'm king of the world. I'm borrowing money from another country that I don't have to repay and giving it to our immigrants. Wait, wait, do I have like ultimate power? I don't know. But then more come. It's like, then, oh, they're giving away uh, money. All right, well, cut it off right now and then allow for so many to come each year, documented. Uh, yeah. And I know that's like not great for business, but I guess slow things down until we can figure out a better plan just slow it down because we need some time to think well we 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 had since when was the flu when did the flores agreement brian say that we were supposed to come up with a plan for years 2001 ago? yeah by 2001 yeah okay so we're yeah, 20, well, 20 years then I'm, late. I'm assembling the best thinkers and no one's leaving the room till we got something better yeah Needless to say, bro, probably your grandkids would be talking about their grandfather who was king of the U.S. at that one point, and he, and he still didn't come up with anything. So, you know, but nonetheless, Brian, what do you have the kind of a final? We have, about, we have three minutes left, and the, back, the pack back is going to go up in two minutes. Yeah, so I would just in. encourage everybody when you hear the term illegal immigrants or illegal alien, you know, try to, try to unpack that for yourself. You know, so that when you're in conversation with others, you can be more precise about exactly what the situation is. Are they asylum applicants? You know, are they are they simply undocumented? Do they have legal status? You know, that and just if, if you if you have any interest in, in you know, in, in being involved in this area, kind kids in need of defense support kind .org is the organization I worked with. Um, you know, this is a, this is not an easy, there are no easy solutions. You'll find that over the years, you know, this, many other things, the complicated nature of life is what makes it so interesting. And, and that's the, these are the skills that Sam is trying to help you guys hone in on critical thinking to unpack what might just be, you know, otherwise very superficial, uh, levels of knowledge. So. You know, you're, you're all doing the right thing. And I just, I really appreciate the opportunity, Sam. Uh, thanks oh, very much. Yeah, it's awesome to have you here. Do you feel like you're dumber now than you were when you were an undergrad? I get dumber every day. Yeah, dude. I, I know, man. God, yeah. I just feel like I know so much less. See what, Steven, see what you have to look forward to? Right. Yeah. I feel yeah. like. You know. I mean, it's, I gotta tell you, it's, it's a lot, but it's, it's fun. I mean, you just, there's so much to know and you know, it, it's, you can get overwhelmed, but just yeah. keep at it. It's hard for me. Hey, top hats up by the way, everybody. I feel um, like I have to like think about what I'm thinking about now. Like I have to think about what I already know. I, like I don't even know what to think now. Yeah. The, the thing you want to do is think about everything that you don't know. Um, it's really, yeah. Hey, Brian, uh, what's one thing you've learned about being a white man? So you're you're Jewish and Italian. Is that right? You're not. You know what, Sam? I did 23 in me. So I'm, I'm Ashkenazi. I'm Southern Italian and I am Western Asian. And that breaks down into from from Cyprus. I have family from Cyprus and from uh, the Levant. Dude. OK. So, what have you learned being married to a black woman in the United States? Uh, yeah, every day is a struggle uh, and every day is an indignity. Um, you know, you learn a lot about white privilege, you know, the, the things that you don't have to think about, the things that you don't have to encounter. Um, and a lot of times they might seem like little minor details, but 
you know, death by a thousand cuts, the indignity of life and, and the sort of the way life is structured for a certain type of person, a person that looks a certain way, thinks a certain way, acts a certain way. You really start to realize that, you know, uh, how difficult it is to be in, in skin that, you know, when nude looks like white, that that's the word, you know, like that, that, that's, you're in a, you're in a world where it's not meant for you. And you're reminded of that day in and day out. And it's just, it's unfortunate. Mm. I thought, you know? Yeah. And you're okay. Thank you, man. Thanks for that. Uh, Steven, thank you. And thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. It was a long time coming that we had this conversation here. We'll have it again for sure.